Hi there, this is John Evans, and welcome back to a new episode of Book in Spain. Approximately 400 years after the death of the last apostle, the city of Rome which had stood from time immemorial, was in flames. The Goths, the Vandals, the so-called barbarian tribes, who did not speak the Roman language, swept through the Roman world, leaving dead bodies, ruined architecture, libraries, and shambles. In the year 410, some of these refugees from Rome must have made their way to North Africa to a place called Carthage, and from there to a little town called Hippo, where one of the most eminent minds of the ancient world, Augustine, was bishop. In his work, The City of God, He explained that the fall of Rome was not because of the empire's conversion to Christianity, but because men and women had sought their own will instead of serving true and everlasting love, self-sacrificial love, love that is patient, love that is kind, love that bears all things, Love that does not dishonor. For Augustine, service to the person of Jesus Christ as God means love of God to contempt of one's inflated or false self. Rather than the world's obsession and deification of the self, to an abhorrence and contempt for God. The things of this world, the things that the media, our friends, even some of our most beloved hold dear, many of them are distractions. Many of them don't bear good fruit because they arise from an egotistical obsession with self and less from a concern to love neighbor as self, to love God above all things. You know, in John chapter 6, there's a beautiful question that's raised to Jesus. What What must we do in order that we might work the works of God. Our Lord's response is that you believe on him whom he has sent. You know what's funny about that statement? He he didn't give a series of laws or creeds. Christ didn't give a series of lectures on how to live a moral life. He didn't say, I'm giving you my four noble truths. I'm giving you a program for self-help or betterment." He didn't point to great spiritual leaders of the past and say, look at their example. Look to my teaching, like Buddha said. No, Jesus said that you believe on him whom God has sent. In John chapter 14, words are spoken that ring down the centuries. Christ says to the apostles in the upper room the night before he is to go to his passion. And Philip says... Show us the Father, and it will suffice us. And our Lord's response to him is, Philip, 
Have you been with me so long and still you do not know me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. And later in that same chapter, responding, I believe, to Thomas, you asked, how do we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father except by me. You know, when St. Patrick came to Ireland, long after the death of the last apostles, when the Roman world was in flames, not so long after the time of Augustine, when he came to Ireland, he was bound in chains as a slave and sent into the fields to tend sheep. There, he contemplated all the mistakes that had led him to this point. He said as a young man he lived more as an atheist, not paying much mind for God. But here he was in the worst place imaginable, or so he thought. I'm sure he was beaten. I'm sure he was spat upon. I'm sure they cursed him. He was British. As an Irishman, I know some hostility that still can linger. But over time, he grew to love this people. He loved their culture. I'm sure he loved their music. He learned their language, presumably, their customs. And as he tended the sheep of his master, like David long ago, he began to discover how, in tending the flock, loving God was not so much about mastering every jot and tittle of the law, but to graciously give up your life for the flock, the flock of God. But Ireland at that time, just as Rome long ago, was steeped in a wicked obsession. You see, with the exception of Israel in the ancient world, all the other nations in order to honor nature as a god. We look at the cycles of death in October, November, and birth in the spring, and around those times of harvest take their little children in order to make the rain come or storms pass or have favor in war. They would take their infants and either bury them alive place them in a contraption that looked like a monstrous beast, as we saw in the pagan festival of Samhain. And, and according to some accounts, even a wicker man. And parents would willingly do this to their children, saying that all was God. That by doing this, that they could master the elemental forces around them. Earth, wind, air, fire. You know, many of the heads of these cults were priestesses. Women who were very powerful, sometimes very educated, could memorize long streams of philosophical texts. Yet ironically, though, they were themselves often mothers, they would dash the heads of their children to pieces, all in the name of what they thought was love, love of the greater good. Remember Augustine's point about the world, this obsession with the creature rather than the creator, with a sense of egotistical deified, inflated self rather than self-emptying, self-giving. In our culture, we have another way of performing that sacrifice. 
in clinics throughout the Western world. Except the new high priestesses and priests wear white coats. And their pundits speak in our higher halls of power. And we applaud. While those who have no voice die. Patrick overturned the idols of Ireland. Many of those high priestesses became great saints. Saint Bridget, who most historians claim never existed, according to early Irish records, was a high-ranking female pagan leader who became a great preacher of the gospel, a proclaimer of God's love and God's word. And under the tutelage of Patrick, spread the faith all throughout Ireland. I, for one, believe that she existed. In the Old Testament, figures such as Elijah would turn the hearts of northern Israel away from committing these same acts, leading through a campaign of preaching and tearing down false altars. And yet in modern times, we have seen the increase of a return back to this false love, this unlove that leads inevitably to death in the name of life. I'm ashamed to say That a month ago, many of you know what occurred in Rome. Some will need repeating, others will not. Therefore, I will keep my remarks about the matter brief. As a scriptural scholar, I identify as a Catholic because of the origins of our faith. I look at the early church and I see the authority present in the successors of Peter. Many here listening to me will agree with me, many will not. That is besides the point. However, what many do not know is that although, according to the First Vatican Council, the Pope can speak authoritatively ex cathedra from a chair of authority, This has rarely ever happened in the history of the papacy. And all other comments that the Pope states, based off of a a prudential decision-making process, many of them are not led with that charism. And while we are to filially and lovingly do our best to keep in mind the honor due his position as our spiritual father, we are to call into question acts which run contrary to scripture and, yes, to sacred tradition. An act against both scripture and tradition occurred a month ago in Rome. There was a pan-Amazonian synod that occurred to address a shortage of priests in the Amazonian regions, and it was believed that there were not enough clerics to offer the sacraments, baptism, reconciliation, the holy sacrifice of the Mass, where we celebrate the presence of God in his giving of himself on the cross. But at that meeting in Rome, there was not simply dialogue with native Amazonians. It wasn't as though the Holy Father sat down and he broke bread warmly and affectionately with those with whom we disagree. No. Instead, statues of a heavily pregnant naked woman coiled in serpents, were brought into a garden. Clerics dressed in 
what can only be called a shameful way, formed a circle around the statues in question. On video that all of you can see, available in LifeSite News and clips of which were seen by Raymond Arroyo on EWTN, high-ranking members of the Roman Korea bowed down to these statues, these idols. Afterwards, Francis, when he had learned that several of these idols had been removed and dumped heroically into the river Tiber, had the idols returned to their former places and kept under guard, apologizing as the bishop of the Diocese of Rome for the insensitivity. Listener, I do not know if you are a Catholic like myself, a Protestant, an evangelical, non-denominational agnostic. But I find it appalling and unusual that the representative of Jesus Christ on earth, whomever he may be, instead of trying to present Jesus, the Son of the living God, to those who do not yet know fully the faith, instead of at least hosting a discussion, should instead bow down to the very idols, which by divine law, he is obligated to remove. And if I might be so bold, yes, even to destroy. Many, from a Protestant perspective, will claim that they don't understand Catholic use of images. In the early church, when most people could not read the Bible, literacy was limited. Pageants and plays would be put on to demonstrate the stories depicted in the Old and New Testaments. In the catacombs, beautiful paintings were arrayed, depicting scenes of heroic men and women who gave their lives in sacrifice, giving their lives for the sheep, the flock of God, in imitation of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and in the glory of his resurrection. In doing so, people learn the gospel through these sacred images. The respect, therefore, shown these images of Jesus and of those who follow Jesus does not constitute worship of the images themselves, but respect for those who have served him in the past, called veneration, or in Latin, uh, dulia, and of course, worship to Jesus Christ alone as Lord in Latin called Latria. Yet you will never, ever see in any church of the one holy Catholic and apostolic communion of saints containing an image of Thor or Zeus or Odin. And I pray that we will never see one of the idol, which I will not name here, whose presentation was made clear in Rome last month. Now, like many before us, our goal, of course, should be to pray. And prayer is not passive. Prayer does not mean retreating into the mountains. Prayer does not mean forming an underground, hidden, 
and out of the way community destined to dissolve into ash. It means to go to war, to take up the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit, and like Paul and St. Patrick before us, to enter into the halls of academia, to enter into the halls of public discourse and communication, and to present the one true living scripture of God, the inerrancy of the word of God. That means cultivating, developing relationships, friendships with those outside the visible walls of the church and hopefully to lead them to Jesus Christ as Lord and God. And like Augustine before us, who engaged with the pagan world through discussion to lead them to Jesus. We should take our brightest, our brightest intellectual minds and set them loose on the world with the truth of the faith. For if we do not do this, how much longer before, after one too many compromises, we see the rise of an anti-church. For with the rise of idols also arises sacrifice of human life. Usually of the old, of the disabled like myself, of the blind and the halt and the lame those who cannot speak for themselves, when the strong prey on the weak, and the weak can only cower in fear. Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox, you non-denominationals, remember that there was a time, once, when all of us could sit in a pro-life rally proclaiming freely Jesus Christ as King. Remember once there was a time only 20 or 30 years ago when in public halls of discourse in the realm of politics, we could say boldly in God we trust. We live in a very different time. And yes, I will call it a time of soft, persecution. And for some of us, it is quite more open and more direct. I am asking you now, as things grow hotter and more uncomfortable in the world, as spiritual Rome metaphorically burned, to listen to me, although I am no Augustine, Although I am no priest, nor bishop, nor pastor, nor monk, but merely a servant of the servants of God, that you return to the scriptures and read, research. But above all else, listen to the great commandments that our Lord has taught us. Hear, O Christian. The Lord our God, the Lord our God is one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are to love him with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your strength and all of your mind. You are to love your neighbor as yourself. May God love you, bless you, and keep you. Pray for me and die for you. For just as the children of Israel were destined to see better days, to put aside the golden calf, and a generation later cross over the river Jordan and enter the promised land, we too, through much trial, we shall see the promised land.
eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of any man what God has prepared for those who love him. We are one house. We are one family. We are one heart in Christ's heart. Do not be discouraged and do not be dismayed. Our Lord says in John 14, if my memory serves me, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. And I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus Christ is going to prepare a place for us. While we are here, though, about his business. Let us make it our highest duty to love one another as he has loved us. Let us boldly put on the armor of God as we read in Ephesians 6. And above all things, let us not be afraid.